Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of Nothing Compares, Catherine Ferguson. <laughs> Catherine, thank you. Such a, every time that ending just gets to me, every time I can't not choke up a little when I see it. Oh, yes, it's emotional. <laughs> tell, tell us about the origin of this project for you. I mean, it's a very, I assume there must have been so many attempts or people wanting to make films about the great Sinead. How did it begin for you? And, how did it happen? Sure. Well, it's a bit of a long-winded story, but um, you know, I'm Irish. I'm from Belfast, and I grew up uh, very fortunately with a father who was a massive Sinead fan, and um, used to play the Lion and the Cobra in our car as we drove through miserable, rainy, troubles-ridden Northern Ireland. <laughs> and this was really, honestly, the soundtrack to my childhood. So. Um, you know, I was introduced to her when I was very young, and then when I became a teenager, and really discovered her in my own in my own right, in my own two feet, I became a bona fide fan. And um, really, when her second album came out, and just loved everything about her, loved what she stood for, loved how she looked, obviously loved the music, and really, I think as um, you know, myself and my you know my friends, and uh, as young Irish people, uh, we were just so thrilled and excited to find her. And then I was very demoralized very quickly to see how she was treated, which um, happened quite rapidly after me really um, discovering her and um, myself. So really I'd say the genesis and the seeds um, of this film really were sown in my teens um, in the 90s. Um, and then it's a story that I just carried with me for um, decades. And uh, then basically how it all came together for this project was that um, I actually did a master's in 2011, and I did a, I had to make a graduation film, and I made a film called Mather, which is Irish for mother, and it was starting to deconstruct a lot of the themes that are, had ended up in this film around Catholicism and Ireland's control over its women, and um, I reached out to her then manager and asked if I could possibly get access to her stems of her music so that I could deconstruct the songs um, and create a score for this very strange little short that I made. And anyway, I did that and sent it off to them once it was finished. And then I heard back about a year or two later and they'd asked, they were asking me to uh, direct her first music video in 15 years for her track, Fourth and Fine. So that um, happened in 2013, I got to meet her got to meet them and um, it was obviously very thrilling and then um, you know I suppose just meeting her then stoked the fires even further for me wanting to like look at this story and her story and you know it really ramped up I suppose I made at that point and um, but then it took a long five years um, to you know I think I was talking about it to friends and to anyone who would listen but it wasn't until I met the film's co-writers and co-producers, um, Michael Malley and Elmer Entage in 2018, that I really found my people uh, and my team, like people who also shared the same, um, you know, passion and interest in this story. And then really um, together we sat down and started putting together like a one-pager, which I'm happy to say is very close to the film that that we've uh, now made but um yeah so made wrote, wrote up this uh, synopsis and this one pager and i brought it to her team then in 2018 and i was expecting a very polite thank you but not a chance in hell response um which i was very prepared for um but i think it was just the timing it was early 2018 the world was on fire, you know, so many, there was so much uh, happening around women's voices and, you know, Trump was in power, Weinstein had happened, um, Me Too had happened, and in, in Ireland alone, um, you know, we had the equal marriage referendum a few years prior, and we were gearing up to, for our abortion ref, uh, referendum, um, repeal the eighth. So it just all, it was just like a really, it's melting pot of lots of things, and I just think everybody thought, oh, crikey, you know, I'm no, sorry, the key point is she wasn't part of any of these conversations, even as, even in Ireland, um, you know, and this person who surely booted the door down and inspired, especially these young activists in Ireland, you know, there, there was no mention of her really um, in, in, in any of it, so I think it then be, became quite urgent to uh, look at her story and get it out there. Very, very long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, it's an incredible story, really, both the making of and the story that you tell. 
And really, the archival footage is just, some of it is unbelievable. I mean, you know, you've got the SNL footage, which is, you know, the terror heard around the world. Like, you know, I was quite young at the time, but I, even I knew about it, and I didn't know about anything at that age. And then you'd like the Madison Square Garden, which is maybe perhaps a little less known, but still quite well known. But some of the other stuff, I mean, like, tell us about finding the archival footage and what it must have been like to... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite wild. I mean, because we uh, worked independently, we had to fund this film through um, our national funds. So we kept getting like little tiny pots, uh, you know, and then we kept building up until we got our full production pots. So every, every time we got a small pot of cash, we would bring in our archive producer, Jo Stones, who's an amazing archive producer in London. And she would just go on a wild, deep dive every time we could afford to get her in. Um, so really, we had three years of archive by the time we started the edits um, in 2021. Yeah, no, maybe she started in 2018, actually. Yeah, we had three years worth of archive, and a lot of it was stuff you know you could get in the archive houses, and you know, it wasn't that hard to find. But when it got really exciting was when we started to um, interview contributors, and particularly um, you know, a lot of the you know, kind of um, first-hand contributors you know, that, that, that were there at the time, and people would just say, Oh yeah, you gotta speak to like Peter in New York. I've heard he's got like a box of tapes under his bed. I'm sure there's something there that you know that might still be usable. Try and you know try and convince him to give you a tape for this box. You know, so we like this kept happening and we kept going on this like wild goose chase to try and track down all of these mysterious um, tapes and, and bits and bobs. Um, but really, they were worth. It was worth it. But, you know, for example, the the wedding. You know, a 14-year-old Sinead singing, you know, I mean, that was just astounding. The videographer didn't film her, which is heartbreaking. <laughs> he seemed to film a post in the middle of the church instead of her, but you can hear her, so that was really exciting. And then you do get that very, very brief glance of her uh, walking across the car park. And then um, the uh, rehearsal footage, you know, 1985, um, seeing her arriving into London just with all that excitement and joy, you know, she's been given this year-long contract to develop her voice and has this team of incredible musicians around her to support her and you can just, you know, you can feel the joy, it's palpable, she's so excited to be doing that and yeah, that was astounding to find and obviously, uh, you yeah, know, I love the Lee Bowery Club, she comes out with that amazing pink look and and stuns everybody you know these are all just bits that have never been um shown before so it was really exciting to find them but we did keep finding them really late in the day and we had to keep going back and like reshuffling our addicts we were desperate to include them but yeah they're, they're all quite late <laughs> i wouldn't call this a new york film but new york is absolutely key is central to the film i mean you know i mean the the, the snl the madison square garden the steamrolling of the albums you know what is it what is it like to be here with the film in New York, so close to where it happened, and yeah. you know, at this r historical remove as well? Absolutely, no, it's been really exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, so much happened here, and she lived here for a fair bit too. I mean, uh, what was so exciting uh, two weeks ago was um, I was sent, I'm gonna give me a heart attack, I was sent a picture of uh, the poster for this film <laughs> in Times Square on a huge billboard, mm. just Sinead's big beautiful face and it just suddenly dawned on me that that's surely the first time even the image of her would have been there since they were steamrolling over her records nearly this month to, you know, or, 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 literally it was, uh, sorry, it was October 1992, 30 years to the month. No way. Yeah. You're making which, that up. No, I'm not making that up. <laughs> Literally for the month. So, you know, it just feels really profound to see her there now, just staring down at everybody. Um, I think it's really exciting, actually. Yeah. What is, what is your hope for this film? I mean, beyond the obvious, you know, that everyone sees it and everything. What would you like this, what work would you like this film to do in the world? Yeah, well, I mean, I, yeah, so <laughs> I suppose, um, you know, it was always for me much more than a music documentary. I suppose, in a lot of ways, it's a bit of a call to arms <laughs> because what I really wanted to do was really reevaluate her story and, you know, try to turn it around so that people could really understand it all a lot better. Um, but also, I really wanted to make a film that highlighted 
the wrongdoing, because it's a trope and obviously lots of women, um, iconoclastic women, are just women who've got a lot to say, often, you know, um, are put up in power pits just to be shot down and, uh, you know, ridiculed and, and you know, it's, it's just a horrible, horrible common trope that often happens. Um, and I suppose what I really wanted to do with this was to really show how wrong people were make them think about that <laughs> and um you know and i think also to be furious i mean i hope you're all furious yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to also be galvanized because i feel actually um you know we didn't intentionally intentionally set out to do this but what i'm really finding which is so exciting now that the film's been screening all around the world is i keep at the end of screenings have these like young 15 year olds coming up to me with their eyes flashing just being like what <laughs> you know like who is she and what you know because and a lot of people a lot of young ones have said you know all they knew about Sinead was that she was somehow bad or that she did something bad she's just a woman who did something bad and I think they're really excited when they see her and see how bold she was and how iconic she was and talented and um yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's galvanizing. I'm hoping it inspires lots of mini Sinead's to go out and boot the door down as well. So <laughs> that's well, my utopian dream. <laughs> how can people find the film from now on if they want to spread the word? Sure. Well, it's uh, it's it's going to it's opening today for um, ten days. Ten days in in America. Um, so it's going to be in theaters for ten days, and then it's going on Showtime on the thirtieth, and then premiering on Showtime on the second of October and then it's doing a full theatrical run in the Ireland and Ar the Ireland, Ireland and the UK on the on the seventh of October. Amazing. Thank you. It's a beautiful film. Congratulations. Thank you.